Please bow your heads with me. Dear Father, we ask this morning that you will speak to our hearts, that you will convict us and convert us and inspire us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. A quote is, that is quite well known goes like this. In reviewing our past history, having traveled over every step of advance to our present standing, I can say, praise God. As I see what the Lord has wrought, I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. This is something that we need to do probably more often, and that is to look at our history and see how God has led us and what he has taught us in our past. I want to point out this text, Matthew 28, 19, a very familiar text. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. And you know the rest of it. But the all nations I want to focus on. Revelation 14, verse 6, right there in the first angel's message, God's end time remnant church is to take God's last message to the entire world. It is an inclusive message, and no one is left out. To every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, with the everlasting gospel, this message goes out. Now, if that is the case, Revelation describes that last message as being one that goes to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, then you would expect then that it would be a worldwide message, wouldn't you? Well, it's very interesting that God has blessed this church through the decades. And the highly respected Pew Research Center did a study of global religious diversity uh, a couple of years ago, uh, three or four years ago, and they looked at the major religions in, in the United States, in the world in the United States. And they looked, and they, they looked at the diversity among the members of their, the various churches. And it's interesting, this was published in newspapers around the, uh, back, in, back at that time, just a couple of years ago. It's interesting that of all the churches, all the major churches, which one is at the top with the most diverse index that they used here, Seventh-day Adventist. Praise God. 37% white, 32% black, 8% Asian, and so on and so forth. Next on down, you see some other churches there. And come down to some of the, like the Southern Baptist Convention, for example, is, a, is the largest Protestant denomination in, North, in the United States, and it's much, much less diverse, and Mormons and Presbyterians and so forth. So we would expect that, wouldn't we? I, I would hope we would expect that. And is it any of man's doing? No, it's God's doing. It's God's message, isn't it? And he is giving that message out to the whole world. I want to draw your attention to a gentleman in the 1800s by the name of William Foy. Perhaps some of you have heard of him. He was a black American in his early 20s in 1842. 1842. Lived in New England. And during that year of 1842, he received two dramatic visions about Christ's second coming and the reward of the righteous. Righteous. 
And because of these visions, he joined the Millerite movement. However, he was reluctant to share those visions publicly because he was aware of the prejudice that was displayed toward blacks, even in the North. And so, in fact, I looked at a newspaper, and I just could not put it up here because it was so filled with profanity uh, in one of the major Boston newspapers describing him and his visions and just uh, utterly attacking him. The prejudice was rampant. No, no political correctness back then. <laughs> so, all right. Um, but William Foy, he experienced these, these, uh, these visions. This was in 1842. And uh, sometime before October 22, 1844, Ellen Harmon heard Foy speak in Beethoven Hall in Portland, Maine. A few weeks later, shortly after her first vision in December of 1844, Foy was present in a meeting held near Cape Elizabeth, Maine, during which she spoke of her first vision. So here he was attending a meeting that Ellen White was, or Ellen Harmon at that time, before she married, uh, was relating her first vision after the great disappointment. Well, as she began and described her vision, William Foy became really engrossed in it and, and what she was saying, and he was caught up in the enthusiasm and pathos that accompanied her presentation. And as she talked of heavenly things, because that was what she was shown in vision, she was shown heavenly things. She had a heavenly guide and the light and the, just the various imagery of beauties of heaven. All this was very familiar to Foy. And it, it, he was caught up in the jubilation of the moment. And he couldn't hold back any further. And he just stood up and, and, pra and praised God. And, and he said, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. He said, this is what I saw. This is exactly what I saw in vision to, you know, about three year, two or three years earlier. And he was really excited. Well, later, many, many years later, Ellen White recalled that event in 1906. And she was having a conversation with some people, and they uh, wrote down what she said. And she recalled and remembered those, those visions that William Foy had related. And she said this. She says, it was a remarkable testimony that he gave. And so she recognized that there was something there. It helped her in her early ministry to have uh, faith in God that he was leading her. Well, William Foy ha had his last vision in the summer of 1844. And the visions that he received were visions that brought out timely truths for that time. A and if the people had accepted, and some people did accept, but many didn't, if the people had accepted those visions, very likely it could have spared them from the great disappointment or at least prepared them for it. God was there trying to help his people, but they wouldn't receive the visions from a black man. Sojourner Truth. Many of you have heard of Sojourner Truth, I'm sure. Well known in American history. She was born actually by the name of Isabel, or she was known by Belle, Bomfrey. Uh, in around 1797, they didn't record the dates of slaves back then. She was born into slavery, and uh, they, didn't, they didn't record the dates of slaves when they were born. So there's no, they don't know exactly when she was born, but probably around 1797. And she died in 1883, quite a long life she lived. She was born in uh, Ulster County, New York. That's about 90 miles north of New York City. And she was born into slavery. Her parents, uh, the Bomfries, uh, she was born, actually she, there were 12 children in that family. And um, their, their owners spoke Dutch. You know, in New York, the Dutch uh, settled parts of the state of New York. And so back in those early days, they spoke Dutch. And so they taught her Dutch only. She didn't know English. And uh, that way, it was 
uh, able to control their slaves a little more. They didn't, couldn't speak the language around, around them. And so she was born there and, and grew up, and she was actually sold into, uh, into to different owners. She, she was owned by four different owners in her life. And um, so she, it was quite a lie. I mean, can you imagine? I can't imagine being owned by someone. Uh, and that's, that's just amazing. But anyway, she had one particular, one of the, her owners was particularly harsh and treated her uh, very badly. But the others were less so. And she was, uh, she grew up there with her family. Now, when she became an adult, by the way, one of, one of time she was put up for sale when she was, I think, 13 years old. And uh, the people, the, nobody would bid for her. And so uh, they threw in a, a hundred sheep along with it. And so someone paid $100 for, her, for that. Just amazing, amazing that that kind of thing was going on not that terribly long ago in our nation. This is in New York State now. This is up in, in the north part. Well, after she became an adult, she grew up to be a very tall woman. She was six feet tall. And you can see the picture there. And um, she learned to speak English. And uh, she fell in love with a, a slave, a very handsome man from a neighboring uh, plantation. And uh, his name was Robert. And she was, wanted to marry him, but uh, the, the other slave owner forbade that because he would lose the children they would have. He would not be able to sell them off as slaves. It would be owned by the other slave owner. So he broke them up. And, uh, and then she was forced to, uh, to marry another slave, and they had children together. Well, it turns out that the state, in the northern part of the country, the states were starting to emancipate their slaves. There, there, there was pressure coming from the abolitionist movement uh, for them to, to free their slaves. And so the state of New York legislator passed a law and said, on such and such a date, we're going to free all the slaves who were born, bef who, were, who, were in, who were slaves before this other date. All right, so, well, 1827, that was the date. She was going to be free. That was three years away. And her owner told her, I'll tell you what, if you work really hard, I'll let you go a year early. So you work for me really hard the next two years, and I'll let you go. So she, she was a hard worker anyway, but she went to work really hard. And for, for two years, but unfortunately she suffered a hand injury and she was not able to work quite as hard. And so her owner reneged on the promise and so going to keep you the full three years till I'm forced to get, let you go. So she escaped. She ran away. She took her infant daughter and ran away, escaped from slavery and went and lived with some uh, people in a nearby area of the state of New York. And she grew up and uh, continued to grow, grow older. Well, it, um, in the year 1843, she attended to, uh, some Millerite camp meetings. And the camp meetings were, you know, uh, t telling the people that Jesus was coming soon. And so she accepted that truth. And she, she decided around that time that she would change her name. She would change her name to Sojourner Truth. And she wanted, to, she wanted to dedicate her life to telling people about the truth. And so the truth of Christ. Well, she went through the Great Disappointment in 1844. And after the Great Disappointment, she drifted away from her Adventist uh, roots there for a while. But then later, she moved to the state of Michigan. And uh, in Michigan, of course, you know, Battle Creek uh, was where the Adventist mo movement had kind of focused then. And, and so in 1856, she moved there to uh, Michigan, and she actually moved to Battle Creek. Uh, 
And she became acquainted with the prominent Adventist leaders there, such as Ellen G. White, John Harvey Kellogg, and Uriah Smith. And even though there's no records to show that she was baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist Church, it is apparently common knowledge that that did happen. Well, she went around the country uh, teaching people and advocating for abolition of slavery and other uh, reforms as well, like prison reform and many other things, many other causes, also for women's rights. You know, the women were not allowed to vote back then. And so, in fact, she was, uh, she was well received and she refused payment for her services as she would go around the, the country, uh, the part, northern part of the country there with her um, tra- traveling and preaching and, and so forth. And she had a, a wonderful voice. She could sing and, and talk and the people were really uh, accepting of her for the most part. But there were many who did not accept her and so mobs would attack her. And she was, at least one time, a mob was surrounded, surrounded her and she was able to, I guess, charm them by singing. She broke into singing, and she stood there and sang beautiful songs, and then she preached to them. And they relented, and, and she finally worked it out with them where they would go ahead and leave and, go and, and so forth. She was a remarkable woman. She was attending a conference one time, and there were a bunch of preachers that stood up in that conference, and they, they, they were talking about women, and they were, they were explain, the preachers were telling the, the audience why it was that women were inferior to men, you know, and why there's, that's the God's plan and so forth and so on. Well, she was listening to that, and she listened, and one after another would get up and say this. But uh, after a while, she stood up. And she gave a speech. It was her, her most famous speech. And it's the, the title of the speech is, Ain't I a Woman? And she related her experience, her life, how she had gone through so many trials and, so, and overcome. And she said, but, but I'm just a woman. Uh, and so anyway, she, one of, she addressed one of the ministers there who had gotten up and said, you know, the reason why women are inferior is because Christ... Uh, Christ was a man, and, uh, you know, and so forth. And she said, she told him, she said, she said, that little man in black there, she pointed at the preacher, she said, he say women can't have as much rights as man because Christ wasn't a woman. And so she asked, she said, where did your Christ come from? (laughs) And then she asked again, and she answered her own question because nobody answered her. She said, from God and a woman. Man had nothing to do with him. (laughs) She passed away in November 26, 1883. More than 3,000 people crowded into the Battle Creek Tabernacle to pay their last respects to her. Uh, And Uriah Smith presided over the services. There was a lady there who said of Sojourner Truth, she was a good Seventh-day Adventist. So she's buried there in Oak Hill Cemetery, just a few feet from the grave of Ellen White, where she awaits to see Jesus on resurrection morning, where he will set his precious jewels, uh, whom death and sin have so long held captive, set, set them free. Well, here's a picture. Uh, this is a painting, actually. Two freedom fighters meet. She met with the president there during the, towards the end of the Civil War. And he's showing her a Bible that some people had given him, some people of color there in, town, in this town of Baltimore. And so, quite a remarkable woman. Well, let's look at, let's look at a few uh, examples of some abolitionists who were Adventists. You know, abolitionists were promoting the idea that the United States should not be enslaving people. And they wanted to abolish slavery. That's why they're called abolitionists. Our founders, many of them were abolitionists. John Byington, have you heard of him? He happens to be our first General Conference president. 
James White was the one who was elected, but James White said, I don't want that office right now. So they selected John Boynton for two years. And then James White became General Congress president after that. He was an active abolitionist, and his home was a stop on the Underground Railroad, which is a, an escape route that was a, a network of homes and farms where uh, slaves who were escaping from their owners would uh, uh, route their way up through to Canada to find freedom. His home was, on, was a stop on that Underground Railroad. Other prominent Advent believers and pioneers were also very involved in either abolition, the abolition cause or wrote uh, publicly uh, against slavery, very publicly. William Miller, Joshua V. Himes, Charles Fitch, Uriah Smith, J.N. Loughborough. In fact, they wrote in the Adventist Review in the 1850s, and they talked about the United States, and they said, Part of the reason that the United States is said to have this lamb-like beast in Revelation 13, the second beast of Revelation 13, lamb-like beast, two horns, but he spake as a dragon. They said the reason, part of the reason for these speaks, speaks as a dragon is because slavery. <clears throat> Only later would they add, uh, really get to the crux of it, which is enforcing the mark of the beast and so forth. But part of that was slavery. James White, Ellen White, Jane Andrews, all of them very involved in this. Let's see what Ellen White has to say on this. Being one of the co-founders of the church gives us a, a, an indication of what uh, our founders, how they saw things and how God saw things. God loves them all, the quote says, and makes no difference between white and black, except that he has a special tender pity for those who are called to bear a greater burden than others. Satan was the first great leader in rebellion. God is punishing the North that they have so long suffered the accursed sin of slavery to exist. For in the sight of heaven, it is a sin of the darkest dye. She recognized that the rebellion in the South was not about states' rights, it was about slavery and it was instigated by Satan. It wasn't that the Yankees were just being aggressive. It was truly Satan who inspired the South to rebel. Going on, she says, this is, she's writing to an individual here. You have, ne you have never looked upon slavery in the right light, and your views of this matter have thrown you on the side of the rebellion, which was stirred up by Satan and his host. Your views of slavery cannot harmonize with the sacred important truths for this time. You must yield your views or the truth. Both cannot be cherished in the same heart, for they are at war with each other. There's a dividing line. You have to make a choice. Going on, she says, the American nation owes a debt of love to the colored race and God has ordained that they should make restitution for the wrong they have done them in the past. Wow. I didn't say it. She said it. She said, advocated that we should disfellowship church members who are pro-slavery sympathizers. Your views of slavery cannot harmonize with the sacred important truths for this time. Unless you undo what you have done, it will be the duty of God's people to publicly withdraw their sympathy and fellowship from you in order to save the impression which must go out in regard to us as a people. We must let it be known that we have no such ones in our fellowship, that we will not walk with them in church capacity. Many Sabbath keepers are not right before God in their political views. These brethren cannot receive the approval of God while they lack sympathy for the oppressed colored race and are at variance with the pure Republican principles of our government. The view of our land requiring us to deliver a slave to his master, we are not to obey, and we must abide the consequences of violating this law. The slave is not the property of any man. 
God is his rightful master, and man has no right to take God's workmanship into his hands and claim him as his own. Now, this law here is speaking of, she is speaking of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. The United States passed the law, and it was because of pressure from the southern states to do so, and it was a compromise. And uh, so they, they passed this law. It was an egregious law. It required everyone, even in free northern states, to return fugitive slaves to their owners. No choice in the matter. You could be required to join a posse to go and capture escaped slaves if asked in you know, your local community. If, you're, if the sheriff came and, and to your door and knocked and said, you must join this posse. We're going to go look for escaped slaves. We have some reports there in the, in the neighborhood. They had to do it by law. And this, this, this had been passed in 1850. She wrote this in 1859, nine years later. Now, the reason why is because the Supreme Court had upheld that law just very shortly before that in 1859. So she wrote, we are not to obey this law. And she was not advocating obey, disobeying God, man's law. She normally would be in favor of that. But in this case, not so. Speaking of the Civil War itself, here's what she said. God is punishing this nation for the high crime of slavery. He has the destiny of the nation in his hands. He will punish the South for the sin of slavery and the North for so long suffering its overreaching and overbearing influences. Now listen to this. All heaven beholds with indignation human beings, the workmanship of God, reduced to the lowest depths of degradation and placed on a level with the brute creation of their fellow men and professed followers of that, of that dear Savior whose compassion was ever moved as he witnessed human woe, heartily engage in this eno enormous and grievous sin and deal in slaves and souls of men. So who is doing this? She says professed followers of our dear Savior. Christians, in other words, professed Christians. She says, angels have recorded it all. It is written in the book, the tears of the pious bondmen and bondwomen, of fathers and mothers, children and brothers and sisters, are all bottled up in heaven. Agony, human agony is carried from place to place and bought and sold. God will restrain his anger, but a little longer. His anger burns against this nation and especially against the religious bodies who have sanctioned and have themselves engaged in this terrible merchandise. Did you realize that? It's just hard to comprehend. Did you ever understand that God's anger burned against the United States? And especially the churches in the United States. Such injustice, such oppression, such sufferings, many professed followers of the meek and lowly Jesus can witness with heartless indifference. And many of them can inflict with hateful satisfaction all this indescribable agony themselves and yet dare to worship God. It is solemn mockery and Satan exults over it and reproaches Jesus and his angels with such inconsistency saying with hellish triumph, such are Christ's followers. So, Let's look at the context here. In the 1840s and 1850s, the times we're talking about here, there was a deep divide that was taking place in America. Not only in the nation, but in the churches. The three angels' messages were sounding. You know, we're familiar with that. And William Miller and so on and so forth. And the Sabbath truths were coming to be. And the, these three angels' messages were that God's judgment hour had arrived the Sabbath truth, Babylon has fallen. In other words, the apostate Christianity had fallen, was falling. And the message that we are not to accept the mark of the beast, but instead we are to keep God's commandments and have the faith of Jesus. You know these messages there in Revelation 14, three angels' messages. That's what was going on right during this time. But we're building up to these... Civil War. So in this time frame, all while this is going on, 
Babylon falls. That's one of those, that's the second angel announcing that Babylon falls. Churches are split, are splitting over slavery in America. Take, for example, the Southern Baptist Convention. A uh, Southern Baptist Church was, is today's world's largest Baptist denomination. It's America's largest Protestant church. And in 1845, Southern Baptists decided to separate from the other Baptists, the American Baptists, as they were called, I think, in defense of white supremacy and the institution of slavery. This is all documented in history, well known. And now, thankfully, the Southern Baptist Convention did not, uh, uh, but, well, I shouldn't say thankfully, maybe I should, said they did not officially renounce using the Bible as a justification for slavery and white supremacy until June 20, 1995, when they issued a formal resolution on racial res reconciliation where they admitted for the first time their history in the slave movement. They apologized. Amazing, amazing. And they weren't the only church. Many other churches, the, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, they split as well into north, south, and, um, and ab advocated for slavery and, and tried to show it from the Bible. Notice the date, 1845. When did the second angel's message begin to sound, that message that sa announces that Babylon is fallen? Right before this time, right before this time. And sure enough, those churches that were rejecting the messages of, of, of God were falling at this time. Well, let's fast forward for a moment. Keeping in, 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 in this same vein where the churches are splitting between north and south over the slavery issue, things change over the decades, don't they? Let's fast forward for a moment. We're going to go back to the 1800s here momentarily, but I just want to point out something. And this well-known figure... Uh, Jerry Falwell, Southern Baptist pastor, uh, televangelist, and conservative activist, founded the Moral Majority, as you, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with that story. Um, sadly, many Christians in the South, uh, part of the United States, have been on the wrong side of history all the way along. And, you know, we need to pray for them. We need to pray for them. Uh, God is their judge. But... Here's what happened. It's the facts of history. During the 1950s and 60s, Jerry Falwell spoke and campaigned against the U.S. civil rights activist Martin Luther King Jr. and the racial desegregation of public school systems by the U.S. federal government. Liberty Christian Academy, you've heard of Liberty University, was a, uh, a, school, a Christian school in Lynchburg, Virginia there, uh, which he started which was described in 1966 by the Lynchburg News newspaper as a private school for white students. And on his, evangel or his evangelist program, the Old Time Gospel Hour in the mid-1960s, Falwell regularly featured segregationist politicians like Lester Maddox and George Wallace. So it took, you know, you think, oh, you know, that's ancient history back in the 1800s. Uh, everything's not, everything's nice now. No, I'm sorry. It took all the way up till just our lifetime. And, you know, during the, the, the decade of the 60s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and only when society moved past them were they forced to shut their mouth and stop talking about these kinds of things openly. And, again, we need to pray for our brothers and sisters out there who have been on the wrong side of history. Okay, the question is, are we on the right side of history? If we are on God's side, we will be on the right side of history, and we will follow the golden rule. Well, let's go back to the 1860s. Here's what Ellen White said. I had a view and vision of the late disastrous battle at Manassas, Virginia. The northern army was moving on with triumph, not doubting that they would be victorious. Northern men were rushing on, although their destruction was very great. Just then, an angel descended and waved his hand backward. Instantly, there was confusion in their ranks. Then it was explained, in other words, angel explained to Ellen White what happened, that God had this nation in his own hand, 
and would suffer no victories to be gained faster than he ordained, and no more losses to the northern men than his wisdom, in his wisdom he saw fit, to punish the north for their sin. The sudden falling back of the northern troops was a mystery to all. They knew not that God's hand was in the matter. I've been reading a book here recently by a professor from Southern uh, Adventist University. He's a history professor. And he has carefully documented the re and researched all these different events. You know, Ellen White had quite a few, uh, had some visions, and she saw things going on with the Civil War. And she saw ahead of time that it was going to be a terrible war. And uh, most people in the North, at, you know, they thought it was going to be an easy victory. In fact, at this battle here, it was near Washington, D.C. It's just outside of Washington, D.C. in northern Virginia there. It was, it was uh, on, I believe it was on a Sunday. But anyway, uh, regardless of what day it was, the, the people came out of Washington, D.C. And, with their picnic baskets, and they set up on the hillsides around the battle area, and they were going to watch the battle. With, and, and, eat, and eat their picnic lunches because they thought it was going to be a, yeah, easy. The North is going to whip those southern boys you know, in, in a big hurry. No problem. Well, it didn't work out that way. It was a terrible, uh, uh, destructive uh, battle that day. And when the North was a little bit, had a little bit of the edge, God intervened and stopped them from gaining that victory. The North... Remember, God's anger burned against this nation, both north and south. So this is the Battle of First Manassas. That's the Confederate name for it. Or if you go to the Union, the northern name was the Battle of Bull Run in July 12, 1861. The both sides named their battles differently. One would name them by the location, and one would name them by the, uh, the uh, uh, well, some other feature of the, of the land. All right. National feasts, or fasts, I'm sorry, not feasts, fasts. Yeah, national fasts, <laughs> gotta get that straight. Um, here's what, it, you, it, this is very interesting. Ellen White wrote this, she says, I saw that these national fasts were an insult to, to Jehovah. He accepts no such fasts. The recording angel writes in regard to them, ye fast for strife and debate, and to smite with the fist of wickedness. I was shown how our leading men have treated the poor slaves who have come to them for protection. She goes on. It's quite a statement. I won't read it all. But interestingly enough, during the Civil War, both the North and the South would, would call national fasts. And days of, uh, they, would have, they would call for a, a national day of humiliation and prayer, and fasting, and pleading with God to help them, and, and so forth. Now, don't you think that would be a good thing to do? Abraham Lincoln would call in a, a national day of humiliation, and fasting, and prayer. And so was the Jefferson Davis down in the South. In fact, the, the ones in the South called more uh, days of fasting than the ones in the North did. But God's view of that was what? It's an insult. Why? Because the North, even though they're fighting the Civil War, the reason why is because they're not trying to end slavery, even though Lincoln was against it, personally was against it. His purpose for going to war was to preserve the Union. And that's the way it started, at least. And so he, was, he, was, he thought that he would allow slavery to exist in the southern states, that he was required to do so by the Constitution, and, and that it would be okay, but he did not want slavery coming north. So that's the way the Civil War started. The, peop the folks in the south, of course, they were just fighting because um, they, when they saw that Lincoln became president, they, that, they knew that was a signal that he was against slavery and they didn't want any part of that. And so they uh, attacked. So this is the setting here uh, of why these national fasts were an insult to Jehovah. The Civil War was a terrible war. And if you look at the number of deaths, uh, total deaths, you see there that the United, the, for the United States, all the wars, all the major wars the United States fought, you can see 
there that the Civil War here, that's that top one, 750,000 people destroyed in this nation right here. World War II, you would think, now World War II had many, many more deaths. They had, it was something between 50 and 100 million people died worldwide. But the United States did only lost, I shouldn't say only, but, you know, comparatively speaking, they lost 405,000. Uh, compared to the Civil War, it's not even close. And then all the other wars, of course, are much smaller. And even if you combine all the other wars together, it doesn't reach the level, the magnitude of the Civil War, United American Civil War. Terrible war, terrible suffering. Many pictures, of course, show the terrible, this was Antietam, the terrible battle, probably one of the worst battles. Thousands and thousands and thousands would die in a day, a single day. Well, what, during the war, as you know, uh, Abraham Lincoln issued uh, Executive Order Emancipation Proclamation, January 1, 1863. Um, he, he, and it, it freed the slaves, but only in the slave states. It did not free the slaves in the, nor in the northern states. Now, this, did, this is a step, though. It's a step in the right direction. And this changed the focus of the war now. The war was no longer just about preserving the Union, but banishing slavery. Now God could bless. And this was a turning point in the war. And the North started gaining victories after this. And, and within, uh, and by the way, in that same year, the Seventh-day Adventist Church was, was officially organized that very same year. Now, Reconstruction Amendments. Here, the Emancipation Proclamation, like I said, only freed the slaves in the slave states. So how did this, all the slaves in the other states get freed? Well, that was through constitutional amendments, three of them. And Reconstruction was referring to the Reconstruction of the South after, after the war was over. And that was, so this, these three amendments were passed, uh, the Constitutional Amendments. 13th Amendment freed the slaves in all states. 14th Amendment gave citizenship rights and equal protection of the laws. That was bitterly opposed by the southern states. And the 15th Amendment gave the right to vote regardless of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So those three amendments to the Constitution. Now God could smile more upon this nation. Reconstruction period, 1865 to 1877. That's the period of time when the northern troops were in the south occupying it. Blacks were given freedom, allowed to vote, own property. Quite a turnaround for them. They had it, they, they, it, this was actually a good period for them during this transition here. Uh, of course, you know, being freed, freed from slavery, uh, I mean, what can you, it, it's very difficult to adjust. But the northern troops were there to make sure it happened. It was bitterly opposed by, by many, of course, the majority in the South. It ended in 1877 when northern troops were withdrawn under pressure from southern politicians. And uh, then we enter a post-reconstruction period, 1877 on to beyond that time. After the northern troops were withdrawn, you see the rise of the KKK, white supremacy, suppressing black vote, violence against blacks and those sympathetic to their cause, Terrible violence all through the South, lynchings, bombings, intimidation, discrimination. Uh, it's just, it's unspeakable, the things that were going on. If you, if you look back at the history there uh, that, was, that was happening, and it went on for years and years, decades and decades. Here's what Ellen White had to write, 1899 now. We're, we're quite a ways past the Civil War. We're way down 1899. It's about almost to be 1900 here. As a nation... We have been guilty of a great wrong. In the judgment, the charge of neglect will fall with heavy weight upon those who claim to be Christians, but have left millions of people, men, women, and children, to become more and more depraved. In comparison with the great need, there has been very little outlay of means to improve them by teaching them the knowledge of God. After being deprived of their rights and for generations treated like cattle, they have been deprived of the means of bettering their condition. 
Virtually they have been left in heathenism when they might have been helped to educate and elevate themselves. Their color has closed to them almost every possible avenue of improvement. There have been exceptions, but as a people they have received little labor and have little inducement to mental or moral improvement. God will soon take this matter into hand. He will judge the nation for their neglect and abuse of his creatures. This is in 1899 now. This is not Civil War. God will judge the nation still, she says, for their neglect and abuse. The colored people have had before them the example of commonness and adultery. These evils are all through our world, but when the poor, wretched, ignorant race who knew, know scarcely anything of purity and righteousness do commit sin, sin that committed by white people is scarcely condemned, colored people are tortured to death, whether proved guilty or not. And the nation that permits this bears the name of Christian. God says, shall I not judge for these things? It did, it did happen. Uh, she mentions torture to death. It was in, unspeakable, like I said, the things that happened in those many decades after the Civil War, all the way up until through the 1960s, at least. Well, you see here in Washington, tens of thousands of people, KKK marching, making their presence known, terrorizing uh, and so forth. Right there in Washington, D.C. This is 1926. But they were scattered all over. Okay, in, the, in this situation, with this hit, situation going on, what were God's people supposed to do? What, what would you and I have done if we were living back then and you were faced with this kind of situation? Enter Edson White. Edson White. Edson White was the second son of James and Ellen White. And he gained experience in printing work, which is going to help him later. He loved boats and the water. That was also going to help him. But he began, in his adult years, he began to drift spiritually. He got involved in some business enterprises, and, and he drifted a little bit spiritually. And, um, but... Edson renewed his faith and found a new passion in life when in 1893 at a Bible study conference in Battle Creek, he came across a tract of his mother's address to the General Conference in 1891 entitled Our Duly Duty to the Colored People. Of course, you know, the term colored people is the common term back then. So, so he decided, Edson White read that and it convicted him. And it, 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 he, he he was revived spiritually, and he resolved to engage in educational and evangelistic work for the blacks in the South. And, you know, it's a little side note here. It's interesting that Ellen White, when she addressed the General Conference in 1891, she was invited to address the General Conference in General Conference session, World Session, 1891. Now, what happened in 1891? You remember what happened a couple of years before then? The 1888 conference, right? That great watershed uh, righteousness by faith emphasis. You would think that she would talk about that subject. But no, she, she talks about our duty to the colored people. The Morning Star. Edson liked boats. And so he decided, now he's living in Michigan, he decides he would build a boat. And this is a drawing of it up there. And um, so he commenced, he got his friend, who was also kind of a, a former misfit, uh, Adventist misfit, and <laughs> had drifted away, but he came back. And so he got his friend, and they built this big boat. And there's a picture of it, actually, right there. Three stories, it's a paddle wheel, two paddles there. And it's quite a boat. Uh, meeting rooms on there and so forth. And he built this big boat up in this Michigan, in the state of Michigan. Well, how is he going to get, he's going to go and he's going to take this boat and use it to go and reach the people in the south. Okay, how's he going to get this boat, which is way up in Michigan, how's he going to get it down south? 
Well, he has a plan. He did this there in the town of Allegan. Allegan, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly there, in Michigan. So you see Battle Creek is right there. Grand Rapids up there, so forth. All right, so he, this is right there, and it's on the Kalamazoo River. So he followed the Kalamazoo River out here, about right there, to Douglas, right there, and he got, was able to get into Lake Michigan. So he crossed Lake Michigan, heading over towards Chicago area, and there, but a, a big storm came up, and they nearly lost their lives. That storm nearly took that boat down, but God worked a miracle and preserved them. Well, they got over here to uh, around the Chicago area, and there's a, can a canal they had built that connects to the Illinois River. And so they went on down the Illinois River, which you can't see, unfortunately, in this map, I don't think, but it travels down through Peoria here and on down through here, and it joins up with the Mississippi River, right down just north of St. Louis, Missouri. And so they took their boat down to the Mississippi River. Once they got to the Mississippi River, then they could follow it right down through, you know, by Memphis there and on down here. And I'm sorry you can't see the river again. The color of the screen doesn't help very much with that blues. It shows on my screen. But anyway, um, so they came down here to Vicksburg. Vicksburg, right there. Mississippi. Mississippi. Vicksburg, Mississippi. That's right. And right there on uh, Interstate 20 goes through there right now. And there's Jackson. That's the capital, I believe, right, of uh, Mississippi. And so right there, that's on the Mississippi River. A big Civil War battle had occurred there. And uh, not that long before, actually. And there's Yazoo City, Yazoo City, and some other towns around there. So what they did is he set up, he stopped right in Vicksburg, and he set up. In fact, that picture there is when they're at Vicksburg. That's, that's taken in Vicksburg when they're docked there at the town of Vicksburg. On this uh, Morning Star boat, they had meeting rooms like this, and they had quite a crew. Uh, there's, there's the boat staff. That, um, and um, they used this crew to, to minister to, primarily to the black people of the South. And so they, they, they would educate them because they, the people, the, the slaves didn't know most of, the time, most of them, didn't know how to read or write or any of those. They were not edu educated. And so they were able to help them and help to educate them. Now, they met with a tremendous amount of opposition from the white community uh, because why do you think that was? Why, why not help somebody? No, it, you can't control people who are educated. It's not as easy to control them. So they were upsetting the social order of the South. And so they had to be really careful. Uh, and they met with opposition and death threats and so forth. But God preserved them. And so they set up a school there in Vicksburg, Mississippi. There's a picture of it. In the late 1800s, early 1900s. And they spent eight years there. Edson White and his crew spent eight years. And by the way, Ellen White, he was writing to her. She was over in Australia at the time. And he was writing to her, telling her what his, his plans. And she was writing back, giving a, a counsel and, and encouragement, praying for him and so forth. She, she knew that God was with him. Mission, they set up a mission school there in Pittsburgh, Mississippi as well. You see quite a large group there. And there are some of the young scholars uh, there at that school. And uh, another, he set up the mission, Southern Missionary Society, Edson did. He established that in 1898. And that was to carry the principles of Christian education to the people of the South. Their first headquarters was in Yazoo City, Mississippi. They had the Dixie Food Company, you know, for health foods. Uh, they had something called the Herald Publishing Company. So he, by fact, he had a, a printing press right there on the ship, on the boat, because uh, he knew how to print, and he knew about the publishing work, and he actually, they would print uh, tracts and so forth to give away, books and so forth. They set up the uh, Nashville uh, Colored Clinic, they call it, back then, and 28 mission schools with 1,000 pupils by 1908. And these are the various 
pictures of drawings of those schools and institutions that they set up all around the South there. It really spawned a, a large movement all across the South. Sanitariums, we would call them lifestyle centers today, schools, publishing houses, and colleges, later on colleges. And of course, you know, the Southern Publishing Association was set up there. That was part of this. Uh, later on, it merged with the Review and Herald Publishing Association. Well, they set up Oakwood College. That was founded in 1896 in the town of Huntsville, Alabama. Many of you are familiar with that. That's in northern Alabama. That's where, if you drive through there, you'll see the Saturn V rockets and all the rockets. You know, that's where the, uh, that's where the uh, rockets were developed. Uh, John von Braun Center, you know, uh, there to help develop this, the rockets that would go to the moon in 1969. That was all done there in Huntsville, Alabama. And so Oakwood College was, was set up there. Uh, they, they met with stiff opposition, but God preserved them. Um, and so today, that, you, that's a university, and it's well-known, quite well-known and respected. A large, quite a large university there. So just showing how uh, small beginnings, God was able to do miraculous things. Well, let's look at some notable alumni that comes, came from this, have come from Oakwood College and now University. You might recognize some of these. Edward Earl Cleveland, E.E. E. Cleveland. Uh, he is, was an author, a civil rights advocate, an evangelist of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And at his campaigns, he, he baptized over 16, 000, or about 16,000 persons. Just an amazing story. E.E. Uh, e. Cleveland. In fact, it's interesting. Back in 1954, he was young, dashing uh, minister, uh, and he set up a large tent in the middle of Montgomery, Alabama, right in their crime-infested district. And you know, back then they would set up tents, large tents. You see a picture of it right there. That's that one of the tents there, and he's there preaching. And what happened was the police came in and patrolled the aisles of his tent. They were trying to enforce a Montgomery City ordinance forbidding the assembling of blacks and whites together. And uh, so E. e. Cleveland just told the people, let the police do their work. And so they did their work. Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., was in the area, and he attended one night, at least one of those nights. And he met later, he met uh, after one of the meetings, apparently, he met E.E. Uh, e. Cleveland. And he said this, he said, I heard that a young Billy Graham had come to town, but all I heard was the law, the law, the law. How would you respond? Here's what Cleveland responded, undaunted and non-apologetic. He said, you must, have come, you must have arrived late because I preached the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. Mutual respect ensued after that, and they became lasting friends. And later, probably in part of this friendship, uh, Martin Luther King spoke at Oakwood College in 1962. Well, also in attendance at, w at least one of those nights in that meeting in 1954 there in Montgomery, Alabama, was a local seamstress. Anyone guess who that might be? A local seamstress, Rosa Parks. One year later, she would take a bus, a very famous bus ride. Interesting how people who, who li whose lives get touched with the message of truth. Charles D. Brooks, C.D. Brooks, better known as, you're, you're, I'm sure many of you are familiar with him. He was a foremost Seventh-day Adventist evangelist, 20th century, baptizing 20,000 people. Powerful revival and reformation preacher. And he learned the truth from reading the great controversy, he and his family, and joined the, the, the Seventh-day Adventist church. He attended Oakwood College he once said this, evangelism is the elixir that warms up a cold church, the force that moves the members from standing on the premises to standing on the promises. 
He, was, he had lots of sayings like that. His rule was, don't ask anybody for permission. Just put up your tent and start preaching. <laughs> he was quite a, quite a hero of faith. I'm, you probably see him. He's currently the Senate chaplain, the United States Senate. Rear Admiral Barry Black graduated or attended Oakwood as well. And Pastor John Lomacang of at 3ABN, you're familiar with him, I'm sure. Attended there as well. Wintley Phipps, famous preacher and singer. He's sung for at least six presidents. Very well known, quite well known. So where are we today? In light of all this, where are we today? Our legacy. How is it? How is it? Have we, have we continued the legacy that was handed down to us? Have we been faithful to our founding fathers in this church and to the God who brought this church into existence? Have we been on the right side of history? What is our mission? And our mission is to proclaim, the live, and, to, to proclaim and to live the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. To prepare a people to meet their God. And this quote, I really... Th- I really like this quote here because I believe it sums up our mission. The last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. That's the character of love of of Jesus. The children of God are to manifest his glory in their own life and character. They are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. The light of the Son of Righteousness is to shine forth in good works, in words of truth and deeds of holiness. As you think about it, how we treat others, how we think of others, it plays a huge part of this. Christianity is practical. And, you know, God looked at this nation, He looked at individuals, He looked at churches, and He says, How are you treating your fellow man? That makes all the difference in the world. You can preach the gospel. You can preach the Bible all you want. But if you're not treating your brother and your sister as Christ would treat them, it's all for naught. And this is the message that God wants us to understand today. And it's a message of grace. You know, we read that, we we, we sung that song, we sang that song at the beginning Amazing grace. And who was that written by? Who was that authored by? John Newton, a slave. Uh, a, a, he was a slave trader. He was go over and bring the slaves from Africa, and deliver them to England and, and, and North America, perhaps. And, and, and he was in the slave trade. But God reached down into his heart and changed him. And he turned from that life. And he turned and he became an abolitionist. He said, I must be stand up against this. It's part of Reformation. We need to reform. Revival and Reformation change our attitude. The Bible sums it up well. Mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. So our legacy is one that God has given to us. God has done it. He has set this church up. He set it on the right course. He asked us, to, he asked our church, those who he entrusted with his truth for the end times, he asked his church to lead the way. Lead the way for the rest of the world to follow. We should not have to follow society or others in that sense. God wants his people to be the head and not the tail. So let us continue that legacy because not everyone has done that. I will not, be, I will not stand here and, and try to tell you that everyone within the Seventh-day Adventist Church has done the right thing in this regard. Not at all. <clears throat> but by God's grace, We will live up to the legacy of our founding fathers and of the call that God gave this church.
Let us continue that legacy and not falter as, as others have done. We have nothing to fear for the future except we forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. Our call to action is this, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. The darkness still surrounds the, world, the earth. There's still much work that needs to be done. And God is calling for us to arouse and finish the work. Finish the work that he's given to us, the mission. Because he wants to end all this misery and take us home. Let us.